You're watching Vinyl at Puma Gaming. Hey guys, back with another Fallout 4 countdown, and today we're going to be going over what I think are the top 6 best DLCs in Fallout 4. Even though there are only 6 DLCs for this game, well, there are actually 7 add-ons, but there are only 6 DLCs. What I'm trying to say is that these are the top 6 best DLCs in the entire game. Seriously though guys, today I wanted to discuss what I think are Fallout 4's best and worst DLC add-ons. Uh, now, I figured that what we could do is rank the DLC from worst to best, and then I could discuss more in detail why I think the worst DLC is the worst, and why the best DLC is the best. So, I guess without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Now, I sort of alluded to it earlier, but there are technically six DLCs, however, there are seven total add-ons so far for Fallout 4, and that's because I'm including the high-resolution 50 gigabyte texture pack that Bethesda released in February 2017 for the PC. Uh, I will discuss that in this video more in depth, However, I do want to go ahead and discuss some of the DLC first. So I'm probably like most people in the sense that I tend to prefer Fallout 4's campaign DLC as opposed to the settlement content. That said, I do like what the designers at Bethesda decided to do with Vault 88 that was a part of the Vault Tech Workshop add-on. While I wasn't too crazy about the lore implications presented by Vault 88, it was cool that Bethesda took the time to design a large area that interconnects with some of the surrounding areas from the vanilla game. For example, once you activate certain portions of Vault 88, you can enter the vault through a manhole between the Fallon's department store and Milton's general hospital that's just north of Gunner's Plaza. And while I suppose it should have been in the game from the start, it was nice that Bethesda decided to add a companion finder terminal, which makes finding your companions that you left at random settlements much, much easier. I think of the settlement DLC, vault Tech Workshop is my personal favorite, and I think many of you will agree with me when I say that the vault Tech Workshop is the best settlement building DLC for Fallout 4. Uh, if you bought it separately without the Season Pass, I would say that $5 for vault Tech Workshop was a better deal than $5 for either Wasteland Workshop or Contraptions. As far as campaign DLC is concerned, we had Atomatron, Far Harbor, and Nuka World that released. Of the three, it's clear that Nuka World and Far Harbor are on an entirely different level when compared to Atomatron. It's pretty hard to compete with DLCs that add entire new maps to explore, filled with quests, weapons, and new NPCs to talk to. While I like Automatron and how you can build really good robot companions, and I actually like Ada as a companion, the questline itself was relatively short. I remember on launch night for that DLC that I beat the thing in about 2-3 to three hours, where both Nuka World and Far Harbor took significantly longer to beat. Plus, the only real side quest in Automatron was a Radiant quest where you hunt down rogue Automatrons. Far Harbor had a fair number of faction side quests, as well as the Vault 118 side quest that parodies murder mysteries. And of course, Nuka World had the Grandchester Mansion side quest, the Hubologist's quest, and of course, you could engage in Radiant quests that allowed you to take over portions of the Commonwealth with the Nuka World Raiders. So, I think at the very least, we could say that Far Harbor and Nuka World were better than Automatron simply because they provided more features for the player to explore and overall just include more content. Now with all of this said, if I were to rank all 7 add-ons or all 6 DLCs from worst to best, I would order them as follows, with the high resolution texture pack being first, Wasteland Workshop after that, then Contraptions, then Vault Tech, then Automatron, then Nuka World, and finally, with Far Harbor being the best add-on or DLC for the entire game. So before we discuss the worst DLC, it might be a good idea to discuss the worst add-on for Fallout 4. Now before it released, I was actually pretty hyped for the high resolution texture pack to come out for this game. Fallout 4 has a fair number of textures that simply don't look as good as they could. Whether it was simply time the developers didn't have or something else, some of the textures that ship with this game look fairly low res. 
Even if you increase the texture quality in Fallout 4's launcher, there was barely any difference. In my opinion, the high resolution texture pack was a great opportunity for Bethesda to go back through the game and touch up some of the lower quality textures. While modders can do great work and make excellent textures, having a small dedicated team come in and upgrade what is already there should be more effective. And the truth is, is that many of the textures were upgraded with this add-on. However, I think Bethesda's desire to future-proof a lot of the textures ultimately made compatibility for many people almost impossible. Focusing everything around the GTX 1080 seems absurd to me. At the time, this was a $600 GPU, and even now, it's a $550 GPU. Not to mention this texture pack was a 50 plus gigabyte file and is actually two times the size of the entire vanilla Fallout 4 without its DLC. On the one hand, I feel conflicted because I would like to see Bethesda make more positive changes to their more current releases, and I feel like criticizing them may make them less interested in doing something like this in the future. However, why is a texture pack twice the size of the original game? Furthermore, why was the texture pack designed with only high-end PCs in mind, but also for computers built within the last two to three years? Based on Steam's hardware statistics, 58% of Steam users are running GPUs with one to two gigabytes of VRAM. Why not consider those users when designing your texture pack? Ultimately, I hate to criticize this add-on content because it was free, and I guess Bethesda didn't technically have to provide this update. However, I wish they did consider more PC users out there. It's not like this update didn't do anything, because there are definitely improvements. It's just that I wish it had done a little bit more and could be appreciated by a wider variety of Fallout 4's PC community. Perhaps it was because I experienced all of the DLC in sequence, but I think the trans transition from Automatron to Wasteland Workshop was fairly underwhelming. You went from a DLC like Automatron, which was relatively similar to the DLC we saw in previous games, to a DLC that mostly just added settlement building objects to the game. If you look at it from a purely feature-based perspective, Automatron had a campaign, it had a few settlement objects that it added, and it allowed you to build and modify robots. Wasteland Workshop, on the other hand, mostly just added settlement objects, and while some of these were actually quite useful, like the powered water pump, the garden plot, the fusion generator, the decontamination arch, the beta wave emitter, and the creature cages, there were some items like the arena contestant platform that didn't ever really seem to work the way you wanted it to. This DLC also added a few new trap defenses which were cool to build and to look at, however they weren't really effective or practical for settlement defense. An argument could also be made that certain things like the fusion generator and the powered water pump were already being accommodated with PC mods at the time. In general, both Wasteland Workshop and Contraption suffer from this particular element, in the sense that many of the features were already being catered to with mods. Honestly, Wasteland Workshop, along with Contraptions, seem like missed opportunities to me. For example, perhaps Wasteland Workshop could have allowed you to raise livestock and domesticate creatures as secondary companions that could travel with you and your first companion. For both of these DLCs, having quests that show you how to build and construct sophisticated machines with new settlement objects would have made things better. For Contraptions in particular, why wasn't there a quest that showed you how the logic gates worked, and some practical applications for these devices in your settlements? Or for Wasteland Workshop, why wasn't there a quest that showed you how to take advantage of the cages, or show you how to get your specific creatures to fight one another? Ultimately, I think the ideas behind some of the DLCs were probably really good, and may have been inspired by what the designers saw on YouTube, both with Fallout and with other games. If you look around YouTube, NPC battles for Fallout games are actually quite popular, and being able to simulate those with all sorts of traps and stuff could have actually been really cool. There are also some instances where players have created CPUs in Minecraft that are capable of displaying text with functional keyboards, and perhaps the introduction of logic gates was to emulate features players have seen in Minecraft with redstone.
However, the execution of these DLCs could have been much better, and at the very least, I would say Wasteland and Contraptions could have really just been combined into one bigger DLC. I think we can all agree that the two best DLCs for Fallout 4 were Nuka World and Far Harbor, as both were substantial pieces of add-on content that the player base wanted. Ultimately though, I think between the two, Far Harbor comes out as the superior piece of content. This isn't to say that Nuka World is bad by any means, however I think that Far Harbor was overall just more sophisticated than Nuka World. For the most part, Nuka World added new weapons and armor, a new NPC, and had a wider variety of locations than Far Harbor did. However, I don't think Nuka World had a particularly complex questline. All you do is go to Nuka World, you join or reject the raiders, and simply take over some territory. One of the three raider gangs betrays you, so you have to go to the Nuka World power plant and then kill them. Or you can decide to reject the raiders by simply killing them all off, and this liberates the Nuka World traitors. Compare this to Far Harbor, Nuka World really has about two endings, while Far Harbor has several. Will you choose to allow the Institute or the Brotherhood of Steel to take over Acadia? Will you destroy the Children of Adam, or will you choose to destroy Far Harbor? Or maybe you could simply leave everyone alone, or totally annihilate all of the people on the island. When you start to look at it this way, Nuka World is simply less complex. That said, I do think the environments in each individual park are more varied than what we got in Far Harbor. The differences between Dry Rock Gulch versus Galactic Zone and Safari Adventure alone are more varied than anything we got with Far Harbor. However, much of the outside areas around the park aren't particularly interesting. The exceptions being the Hibologist Camp and the Granchester Mansion. And of course there's the Dark Souls Easter Egg near Bradburton, but otherwise, there isn't really that much else to see. Now, I may end up not explaining it very well, but I feel like the NPCs in Far Harbor had more depth, and were a lot more memorable than the ones from Nuka World. Other than the gang leaders and Porter Gage, who else is particularly memorable? Everyone else is either a slave or a generic looking henchman for one of the three gangs. Far Harbor, on the other hand, has people like High Confessor Tectus, Kasumi Nakano, Dima, Old Longfellow, and Captain Avery. Even the lesser quest NPCs like the Mariner, Zealot Richter, Cassie Dalton, Faraday, Alan Lee, and a few others are more memorable than most of the Nuka World NPCs. Do you remember character NPCs like Mackenzie Bridgman or any of the other Nuka World Trader NPCs? Now, with that said, Nuka World's Oswald the Outrageous, Nira, and Sito are fairly memorable to me. However, the rest of the NPCs from Nuka World feel more generic and less unique to me personally. Perhaps it's because most of them identify with a specific gang that makes them all look the same. I think another thing that's fairly noticeable with Nuka World is the number of enemy reskins on offer. Granted, things like ants, cave crickets, gazelle, bromeluffs, and rad rats were new enemies. However, there were also a lot of reskins in the form of gator claws, ghoulrillas, and nuka lurks. Far Harper, on the other hand, added wolves, fog crawlers, hermit crabs, gulpers, anglers, and a few more. And yes, while there were reskins like the Blood Rage Mirelurk and the Devolved Rad Stags, Far Harbor seemed to use more new creatures than Nuka World did. After all, half the robots you fight in Nuka World are simply reskins of a lot of the robots from the base game. I also think you'll find that Far Harbor simply has more settlements, it has more new weapons, and also has more new legendary weapon and armor effects when compared to Nuka World. While the vast majority of the new weapons that were added by Nuka World were excellent, Far Harbor simply added more new content. Overall, I think Fallout 4's DLC has certainly had its ups and downs. On the one hand, Nuka World and Far Harbor were pretty well done add-ons, and while they have their flaws, I think both stand up to previous Fallout and Elder Scrolls DLC pretty well. There are also the lacking DLCs like Wasteland Workshop and Contraptions, which didn't really add a lot of new content. Now, I think a lot of the downs, as far as DLC are concerned, were caused by releasing the DLC too close together. 
All six DLCs were released every consecutive month between March and August 2016. For previous Fallout and Elder Scrolls games, the DLC release dates were spread out a lot more. At times, Fallout 3, New Vegas, and Skyrim add-ons were released with two to three month gaps in some cases. Sometimes even more than that. I have a feeling that having more time between each add-on allowed them to make these larger campaign-style add-ons. While releasing content more often does allow you to get more press, and as a YouTuber it benefits me as there aren't really any significant content droughts, I think it would actually be better for a lower quantity of add-ons to come out but be larger and more expansive. For me personally, I'd be okay waiting longer for DLC if I knew the content that I was going to be getting was like Nuka World or Far Harbor. Let's say Fallout 4 released in November 2015, like it did, and Far Harbor came out in February or March. Nuka World came out in maybe May or June, and an unknown third campaign DLC came out in August or September. I would have rather have had that than ultimately have more frequent add-ons that individually may end up offering less content in total. I also think the season pass price increase, in addition to a lot of the settlement DLC, was a turnoff for a lot of people. It would have been better if Bethesda simply asked for $50 to begin with and then developed DLC with those costs in mind, as opposed to starting out at $30, increasing the price to $50, and developing DLC for people people that paid at two different price points. It's true that $50 for a season pass is a pretty hard sell, especially when you could pay $10 more and just get a brand new video game. However, I think if the content added is substantial, people will buy it. At the end of the day, this is just one man's opinion. Uh, Bethesda can do whatever they want, it's just I think they are better off having less total add-ons at higher quality than having a higher quantity of add-ons at lower quality. Alright guys, that's gonna wrap up this particular video. If you like this video, please be sure to leave a like and let me know what do you think is the best and worst add-on content for Fallout 4. Uh, otherwise, click the bell to join the notification squad and as always, take care and I'll see y'all next time.